just to acknowledge um, Eamon and Enda who can't be with us today. Uh, firstly, this particular um, line of thinking came about firstly because we all know that emergency remote teaching is not online slash distance education or online and distance education. Sometimes people put those two together. Um, and there are good reasons for why it wasn't. But we do know that there is also a very solid and long history of theory and research on distance education initially and more recently in the last 20 years online education. So it's not like we are we should be reinventing the wheel here, although at the same time we have got different tools and the context is different. So I'm not suggesting that some of the contributions that have been made in the COVID era are unhelpful. It's just that I think we need to connect them up to previous literature in this field. So that's the kind of thinking that was laying the platform, but platform pun intended, I guess, or the use of the word deliberately, because late last, well, throughout last year, I was involved in an innovative project on commission to the European Commission, who is exploring, and it's one of the actions in the Digital Education Action Plan, a feasibility study around the development of an online um, knowledge exchange platform for digital education. So that work was a bit one of like a project I described that never stopped giving. It kept continuing and continuing. And if you're not aware of it, the commission is likely to announce in days, if not the next couple of weeks, the successful uh, consortium for the new digital education hub for Europe. And this feeds into that work as well. But as part of this project, one of the things I was asked to do by the commission was a review of trends in online learning. So in part, I didn't really want to lose that work because in the final report, the trends didn't really show up because we moved in a different direction. Our, some of the trends, nonetheless, that I spent time writing and reflecting, and um, you'll see in the paper, the one that's just recently been launched, I make a formal acknowledgement of Ender and Eamon because there were just occasions where they I probably don't appreciate how helpful they were in, in having a sounding board. And, and there are others that fulfill that role, but I use them quite deliberately in this particular project. So we have all three of us, a joint paper coming out in a journal that's published in China, quite a reputable journal actually, but it's published in Mandarin. So we don't expect people to read that one. I put the link to the one that is single authored, which came before the joint authored one. So that's a little bit of preamble. The one thing I would just want to put a, a cautionary note on with what I've got to come in the next 10 minutes is these are not intended to be predictions. Um, we know that you can't predict the future. Well, you can actually, but I haven't got time to uh, explain how that's possible, but can be. It's a bet you can win. So there are trends. And what we know is that um, I had a slide that quotes from Winston Churchill, and I thought best not use that here in Ireland. But since it sprung to mind, you don't have the image. But Churchill once said, essentially, the further backwards you look, the further forwards you look. So um, trends uh, are patterns, things and directions. So here's just one of those articles out of the first paper that I gave today from our top 10 list that appears that looks at trends and patterns. So it's not like we're reinventing the wheel here. There is a literature itself about trends and patterns. And so we have drawn on that literature, but a lot of other literature too. I'm not going to explain the methodology of how we did that. And it's not quite like a systematic literature review. So it's probably less a robust. Give you the trends straight off. These are the ones that we've identified, and I'm just going to briefly touch on them. If I run out of time, I think I'll be okay, but if I run out of time, you've had a preamble of them, and you can look at the slides. Um, but the first thing, and we've already touched on this more than once today, um, not just in this session, but in the opening, what do we mean by the language we use? Um, and so in the original brief, we were asked to look at trends in online learning, and that sort of says, well, you better have some kind of way that you define online learning. Um, here's one of those closed access articles, if you can get access to, it's well worth reading because they identified 46 different definitions of online learning, let alone throwing blended into the mix or hybrid or other variations. So uh, we do 
put forward a definition of online learning, but we begin this work by saying that essentially that's quite a problematic thing to do. And you may have heard my comment about um, Sean Bain's comment around definitions per se and the risk of definitions. But this morphs into the first um, trend, which is one of convergence. And if you haven't seen this particular article on, um, from the Edcause Review, I think if I recall correctly, from 2020, um, looking at the merging landscape that we have. Um, and that's really been something that's amplified, I think, through the COVID experience. I'm at risk of citing some of my own work here. It's mainly just because the visual generally helps here for people to understand that there is convergence, there's leakage between these spaces, not just delivery modes, but spaces as well are converging. And that one and the two are not precisely the same. So um, I don't think this is rocket science. We're not telling you anything that you haven't perhaps thought of, but that does come back to that paper as well that I talked earlier on around, is there any such thing as virtual learning anymore? Um, hybrid learning tends to be, or hyperflex hyper learning, these lang this language has now become popularized in the COVID era, a very solid, um, very scholarly piece about hybrid learning, but more as evidence of that convergence because cultivating something as a hybrid is actually where you cultivate more than one thing. I would argue that it's a more useful term than blended in our thinking, maybe not in our practical everyday use because it's, it's hard to kind of explain to students, if you like. Moving on, um, you can read in much more detail in the paper that's there, massification or mass pedagogy. You know, MOOCs still tend to polarize people. This is one of the publications that we profiled in our top 10. I put it here deliberately rather than the one by Aris, who's just produced a paper with the three waves of MOOCs, because A, this doesn't probably get as well recognized. Not everyone would be reading the Asia Pacific Education Review. But MOOCs are very significant still in the higher education landscape, if not the training and vocational landscape as well. Um, not telling you anything new here, but um, people who tend to just see MOOCs as a sideline, uh, I don't think fully appreciate the impact that MOOCs have had. Certainly not the revolution that some once claimed, but they've not gone away and they're continuing to have an impact. This impact was very real here in Ireland or Dublin in particular when Google announced last year their career certificates in partnership with Coursera and micro-credentials. So again, I'm at risk of recycling some of my own work here, but micro-credentials are, I suspect 2022 might be the year of the micro-credential. If you remember, I think it was 2011, if I recall correctly, was the year of the MOOC for the um, uh, by the New York Times, if I again remember the source correctly, seems a long time ago. So that's just part of the massification of education for better and worse, because who could argue about opening up access to education, which leads to the third trend of opening um, access or openness more generally. Um, I'm doing a little bit of sort of insider trading here in the sense of profiling some of our top 10 articles from the earlier paper. So here's another one of the top 10 papers because openness has kind of moved and morphed in many different ways. Firstly, it's been around for a long time. It's not a new concept. We've gone from an open educational resource focus, which is content centric, to more of a practice centric focus, the OEP. An interesting um, article here doing the lit review, if you like, you will see that we've been quite critical in our narrative about this piece of work, um, in part because there's another whole community uh, that overlaps, intersects, but has differences in what open pedagogy might mean. Um, and this particular paper in its lit review can't find a common definition of open pedagogy, which is again, that challenge of definitions. And I don't think Catherine's at the conference. I didn't see her at the opening. She may well be popping in at some stage, but the work with her and colleagues around um, open at the margins highlights that openness appeals to the neoliberals as much as it appeals to the de-schoolers, um, to use those two terms quite intentionally out of the literature. And so this is one of the problems and trends associated with openness is that underlying drivers can be quite different for different ends. 
Um, so I haven't got time to elaborate on that, but it's a, that's not a trend that I see going away. Interactivity, we're going to get more down into sort of the learning design side of things. It was 2003 when Terry Anderson first um, proposed the interaction equivalency theorem, which essentially in simple terms just talked about three ty types of interaction. Now, this comes out of the distance education literature that's impacted the more general learning design literature. Many variations on that theorem uh, with other forms of interaction. And of course, the community of inquiry framework has become very common in um, use around online education. Um, some good critiques of that framework because there's a risk of reifying what is a theory. It's only a theory. It's not necessarily something that exists in practice and reality. Um, but nonetheless, this is how we try to express our interactions without overlooking the role that well-being, emotion, um, two concepts that come out or interactions, if you want to conceptualize it like that from the COVID experience. What I want to do in this piece to finish this section on trends is just challenge us that new technology is going to help us rethink our whole concept of interaction. Um, immersive virtual reality or VRX type environments, we have one at DCU in our business school. What does it mean to interact? is going to be a question going forward. So we might need new theories and new ways of thinking about those. Um, in terms of diversity. I can sort of talk something as a base. Oh, but I can. That's Suri just trying to pop in and help me out there for a second. Sorry about that. Diversity, um, again, wanted to cite some uh, local folk here. Um, we all know about the VLE, the, the LMS. That's the core, that's the backbone that's kept people going through the crisis. But what we're seeing is increasing divergence or diversity in tools. Just one paper um, from a couple of Australian colleagues that documents all of those free open access tools that are available, but some really interesting observations that many of those free tools are disappearing. In fact, as when they get more successful, they've actually get taken over by the bigger tools. So that um, if you think of a digital ecology, diversity is crucial to the survival and the vibrancy of an ecology. But a lot of the small stuff is getting swallowed up by the big stuff. So that's a challenge. And we're now seeing this move, the splot move to um, small things, to it's sometimes linked also to the um, rewilding movement, to claim back the innovation from the LMS, the VLE, because do we really expect a lot of really cutting edge innovation in that one monolith big system? So this is a trend and I summarize it here or we summarize it between things are getting more diverse, but also more closed. Last, uh, not quite lastly, almost there. Um, I think all of us would have been inundated, particularly in 2020, almost on a daily basis from the snake oil merchants trying to sell us ed tech. Um, DCU is a Google using institution. It does change the way we do things for better and worse, um, as opposed to being a Microsoft based environment. But good article here questioning about the neutrality of these tools and the same uh, criticisms would apply of Microsoft tools as well, particularly when we're now using them in our schools, um, but they are woven into our daily fabric of work. They're not neutral. Um, this whole area, of course, springs to mind, not just making money um, from here, Holden IQ, about online learning being part of the globalization movement and the opportunities for higher education to be seen and sold as a commodity, but it links to debates about um, privacy, um, the online exam invigilation and all the privacy and so forth issues that went on during COVID. I personally take a view that I get a little hot um, water for from some colleagues, which is that um, my expression that I'm told is an Irish one, that if we're not around the table, we're more likely to be on the menu. So I take a personal view that I want to work with these industry providers. I don't want to um, demonize them. Um, because I do have experience of having helped shape changes in the past, but let's not be too naive at the end of the day. Some of these um, 
companies we're talking about and the huge growth in startups have a profit agenda. And I can't see that changing. Lastly, um, sort of coming full circle to the original um, paper that presented in the first, se first paper in this um, session uh, on the greening of ed tech. And I do think that this is going to challenge our institutions because historically distance education has been sold as a green technology, as a green solution for the future of higher education. In fact, Educores, who have taken over the Horizon Report, the annual Horizon Report, presented one of the um, disaster or chaos scenarios last year around how um, online might be the savior for higher education when we have um, planetary challenges um, to the point that we have to change the way we do things. So let's see how this plays out. I don't think there are many of us, me included, that really understand what that might mean in our day-to-day -day life, let alone in learning. But I do think we need to put that on our agenda. Ultimately, there's nothing particularly um, rocket science here in this conclusion. Um, all of this tells us that educational technology, digital education, online learning, are part of a wider social practice. And we mustn't divorce online education in particular from everything else that happens with an education, which is inherently a political and linked to our policy makers as well. So there are policy solutions as well as problems that we need to involve ourselves in. Wrapping up with probably 30 seconds to let you ponder on these questions before you go off to um, do whatever it is you need to do, maybe catch up with some lunch is, is there anything new that surprises you amongst what we've listed here as trends? What's missing? I touched on well-being, emotions. We haven't called those out explicitly. We've infused those in others. And so what? What does all this mean? And truthfully, you know, the so what question is a hard one because what am I going to do differently as a consequence of working with AIM and ENDA to look at these trends? They're certainly informing our thinking, but are we doing anything differently? I'll stop on that note. Hopefully there is something useful there and invite you to look at the um, paper we've published for a little bit more follow-up, the one that um, I've done individually and the one to come if you want to read it in Mandarin, but we'll share it in an English version as well. 